with another Reader's Digest reading video. So, in my one video where I was asking for preferences of what everyone would like for me to read next, it was mostly the recipe magazines that everyone had uh, wanted. I did get some requests for certain articles in um, all of my Reader's Digest's issues, but there really wasn't one in particular that got requested a lot, so I would like to just, I just picked this one right here. There was a request for some of the articles in this one. Um, because the recipe magazine one, I think I want to do that more like a role play type thing, so. Um, this is the October 2018 issue of Reader's Digest. So I'm just going to flip through and just choose a couple of things to read, okay? So on the cover we have 50 Old Time Doctor Remedies that really work. We have Your Cell Phone and Your Health, A Deadly Sailboat Race, Cold weather is good for you. Eat the whole kiwi. Sympathy for my bully. Superstitions of the rich and famous. And in praise of messy cars. a lot of articles in here. I wish I could read all of them, but that's too much. So, uh, old time doctor remedies that work. I think someone was interested in that one. Racing the storm. Scout's honor. Sympathy for my bully. I kind of wanted to read the man who willed himself to fly. This one I want to read. Someone had suggested this one. Very superstitious. The irrational fears and habits of famous folks from Lucille Ball to Michael Jordan. And this one also was requested. How to conquer panic attacks. We have all of these different short little um, entries here. We'll see those as I flip through. Mercy for a Thief. The Mama Bear Instinct. I'd like to see that one. Four Wheel Dives. Heaven Can't Wait. I thought this one sounded interesting. On a good Friday long ago, a curious boy was determined to witness God's mysterious ways in all their forms. Okay. The Case of the Expensive Mailbox. These ones are interesting because it um, goes over like a case and like something that actually went to court and it asks you what do you think the outcome should be and tells you what the verdict was and then this one to finish this sentence my favorite one liner is and people write in to finish the sentence 
Learn not to fall. Food parts you should never throw out. From kindergarten to cancer, a love story. Seven surprising ways cold weather helps your body. Thirteen ways your cell phone affects your body and mind. How to make it as a fossil. Okay, so that's everything in there. Letters to the editor. Just about previous article. for a thief. Here's a little one about the mama bear instinct. And then we have here the um, article about the messy cars. Have you ever noticed that with some friends, when they offer you a ride and you get in their car, the first thing they say is, sorry about the mess. Even if the car's interior is so antiseptic, you could perform surgery in there. On the other hand, I've been in cars that more closely resemble the inside of a hamper than a vehicle, and the owner doesn't seem to notice. Here are some things that people have said. It says, I have four dogs, one of whom is chronically car sick. You really wouldn't want to get into my car, unless you're a dog. <laughs> this person says, I keep a duster in the door pocket and use it at lights. And I shake out my floor mats once a week. There's nothing wrong with that. There isn't. <laughs> and isn't is capitalized. <laughs> I divide people into those who brush off my passenger seat and hop right in, and those who grimace and get in with a look of determination and pity. <laughs> I always carry lots of bottled water just in case I break down in a desert, <laughs> even though I live in Philadelphia. <laughs> if I ever disappear due to foul play, the cops will easily be able to trace the last six months of my life from the junk on the floor of my car. My car is spotless. I just wish the rest of my life were this beautiful and well-ordered. I think of my car as my pocketbook on wheels. It contains everything I need for daily survival. Here we have food wrappers, books, thermoses, coffee cups, sunglasses, jackets, blankets, troll doll in a nurse uniform, emergency apocaly apocalypse bag, backpack, flashlights, hair ties, reading glasses, Newspapers, receipts, grocery lists, stuff for good. <laughs> that is exactly my car. <laughs> I try to keep it clean, but, you know. We call my husband's car Meals on Wheels because he has stashed so much snack food in it. Last week, I found a squirrel in my car. <laughs> I'm a teacher, which means my car is full of school supplies. If times get tough, I'll just sell pens, markers, and construction paper out of my trunk. 
My husband has stashed an axe under the driver's seat of my car. Yes, an axe. <laughs> so this is one that I had wanted to read. Um, Heaven Can't Wait. Every so often, the celestial wanderings of the sun, earth, and moon will cause our nearest neighbor in space to become completely immersed in the earth's shadow, in turn producing one of nature's most beautiful sky shows, a total eclipse of the moon. In my lifetime, I've watched the moon become just a shadow of its former self, 18 times. But for me, the eclipse of April 12, 1968 stands out above all the others. I was not quite 12 years old and living in Bronx. The midpoint of the eclipse was to occur around midnight, but since it was a Friday night, I had no worries about homework or going to school the next day. I had received a telescope for Christmas and was so excited that I had already set it up in my backyard that afternoon. It was a perfect early spring day with promise of a beautiful clear night. But there was a catch. April 12th, 1968 also happened to be Good Friday, and there was no way my mother was going to let me skip church. So I did the math. The service at St. Benedict's Church started at 9 p.m., and the eclipse would commence at 10.10 10 p.m. I knew from experience that the average service in our parish lasted about 45 minutes. I had plenty of time. A Good Friday ceremony is a very somber affair. Everything is draped in black and there are long periods of absolute silence. On this particular night, Father Patrick Okada felt a need to make it an especially drawn out and mournful affair. Add the fact that on this particular night, the packed service started late and I was anxiety ridden. I squirmed with uneasiness as I eyed the big clock at the back of the church. By 9.45, Father Okada, or Okada, was still deep into his homily. I kept whispering to my mother that if the sermon didn't end soon, I'd miss the eclipse. My mother, unmoved, just stared straight ahead and said nothing. Finally, just before 10, I did something that to this day, I'm surprised, did not land me in the netherworld roasting on a spit. I bolted out of my pew and hightailed it for the exit. Joe, Joe, my mother whispered between gritted teeth. My fate was already sealed, so why stop now? The only sound other than Father Okada's voice was that of my church shoes slapping against the marble-floored center aisle as they propelled me toward the exit. Every eyeball, shocked, horrified, envious, was on me as I threw open the massive wooden front doors and let them slam behind me with a resounding boom. Adrenaline kicked in as I raced toward East Tremont Avenue and caught sight of the full moon glowing brightly in the southeast sky. Dodging cars and pedestrians, I crossed three streets and two major thoroughfares and arrived home with only minutes to spare. I was consumed with glee it had not yet considered the potential consequences of my display back at St. Benedict's. When the service finally ended, 
My mother and sister took their places in the line of people filling out of the church. Waiting near the front entrance was Father Okada, along with other priests, greeting the parishioners as they left. When Mom finally reached Father Okada, she apologized profusely. For some stupid reason, Joe just had to see the moon eclipse from the very beginning, she said, before promising to severely reprimand me as soon as she got home. Father Okada's response, which my mother shared with me later, saved my life. If your son wanted so badly to see this wondrous spectacle of nature, an event that God himself has brought to all of us tonight to enjoy, then I cannot fault him at all. Looking in the direction of the other priests, he continued, We were all discussing the eclipse before tonight's service, and we too are interested in seeing it. Then, taking a few steps outside, the priests, as well as my mother, my sister, and a coterie, I try to say that word, of parishioners gazed upward toward the moon. A small scallop of darkness had made itself evident on its left hand edge. Isn't this an amazing example of the precision of the universe? Father Okada asked no one in particular. Even Mom was impressed. Back at home, I was a wreck. As I watched the eclipse through my telescope, I considered the implications of my mini-rebellion at St. Benedict's. In retrospect, maybe I should have stayed to the end of the service. Retribution, I knew, was nigh. So when my mother's car pulled up in front of our house, I kept my right eye firmly pressed against my telescope's eyepiece as the moon slowly morphed into a burnished coppery red ball. Surely I thought this would be my last view of the event before all heck broke loose. I heard the front door creak open and shut. I heard my mother's footfalls grow louder as they came closer and closer until she reached the backyard. I soaked in the night's sky performance, hoping to imprint it on my brain before being dragged away by an ear. My mother stopped behind me. I braced myself. She leaned in. I leaned away. And then she gave me a peck on the cheek with my sister in tow. She headed inside saying merely, enjoy your eclipse. On Sunday night, January 20th, 2019, in a play whose celestial script was written eons ago, the moon will once again plunge completely into the Earth's shadow, producing a spectacular total eclipse of the moon totality will be particularly dramatic for those of us in North America, where the ruddy moon will burn high overhead against the backdrop of a cold and starry winter sky. I hope all of you enjoy your eclipse. And here, this is a photo of lasting interest. I'm not sure how well you can see that. It's called Their Corner of the Sky. The Altai region of southern Siberia is famous for things that fly. Those white specks are butterflies. Some of the more than 150 species attracted to the area's humid summers. The hulking metal objects on the ground were airborne once, too. They are pieces of rockets that plummeted to Earth after launching from Russia's Baikonur Cosmodrome. 
Having a rocket remnant land in your yard isn't for everyone, but the locals make the best of it. These men are scavenging for high-grade titanium and aluminum alloys to sell. Some locals have recycled the pieces into garages, sheds, and fences. It just goes to show that one person's space junk is another person's treasure. Definitely an interesting picture there. Those are all butterflies. There's a bunch of ladies in their underwear. Just in case you wanted to see that. This is the case of the expensive mailbox. So I'm not going to read that, but it's about um, like a homeowner's association and their rules. And I guess they were taken to court. These are your true stories in 100 words. I don't know how I'm going to leave anything out. <laughs> I'll read a couple of these. The bad guys. My son was almost five when we took a trip to the post office. As I filled out my return receipt form, my son looked around at the many people in line. I noticed him staring at the pictures on the wall. Who are those people on the wall? he asked. I explained to him they were bad people that the police were searching for. My son looked up at me with the sweetest face and asked, then why didn't they keep them when they took their pictures? <laughs> I was without words. It's from a woman in Florida. Let's see this one. A stranger love. One month after we moved to the United States from halfway around the globe, I drove to Dulles International Airport in Washington, D.C. with my wife to pick up her boss's guest. When we got back to the parking lot, our car was dead. It was an unexpected and embarrassing situation. Since we were new to the area, we were stuck. We had no one to call. Then a gentleman who parked his car a few spots over came to help us jump our car. Next time, it might be me in your position, he said. Spread the love. I like these to finish the sentence. My favorite one-liner is people write in to finish that sentence. So this one from Tacoma, Washington. My wife told me to stop impersonating a flamingo. I had to put my foot down. This is from Meridian, Idaho. Love is blind. But marriage is a real eye-opener. I tell my friends that I run things at my house. The vacuum cleaner, the garbage disposal. <laughs> it's from Fresno, California. You might be an Alaskan if there's a moose in my driveway. is an acceptable reason to be late for work. from Waterloo, New York. The best thing about the good old days is we weren't good and we weren't old. This is from Middleburg Heights, Ohio. I named my two dogs Rolex and Timex. They're watchdogs. This is from Fieldsboro, New Jersey. I was raised as an only child, which really annoyed my sister. Um, life in these United States. A 
the art of living. Falls send more people, especially younger fo folks, to the doctor than any other injury. And this one's about learn not to fall. Food parts you should never throw out. I'm not going to read it, but I'll just list them. Pineapple core, kiwi skin, onion skin, banana peel, well, citrus and zest, watermelon rind and seeds, celery leaves, one about from kindergarten to cancer, a love story. The soldier never forgot his childhood crush, and once they reunited, neither war nor illness would keep them apart. Seven surprising ways cold water helps your body. Boosts your brain, burns calories, activates healthy fat, alleviates allergies, encourages better sleep, fights infections, strengthens your heart. World of Medicine This is the section All in a Day's Work Just a little entries here Don't read All time doctor remedies that work This one's very long. Um, just um, quickly read them. Honey to heal a wound, cherries for gout, cod liver oil to keep your eyes healthy. Your grandmother and her doctors probably swore by these fixes, and now science is catching up with them. Researchers have produced hundreds of studies in the past five years about the effectiveness of home remedies, but not all the old-time solutions really help. That's why this list focuses on treatments with evidence to back them up. Remember that even natural cures can interact with medications. If you take pills regularly or have a chronic health condition, check with your doctor before trying these. For age spots, try buttermilk. For aller allergies, try vitamin C. Back pain, try comfrey. Blisters, try petroleum jelly. Bug bites, try oatmeal. Burns, try aloe. Calluses and corns, try aspirin. Canker sores, try milk of magnesia. Constipation, try ground flaxseed. For a cough, try thyme tea. For diarrhea, <laughs> Try blackberry tea. For eye strain, try cucumber. For foot odor, try lavender oil. For GERD and heartburn, try globe artichoke extract. For gout, 
dried cherries. For headaches, try peppermint oil. For hiccups, try sugar. For high cholesterol, try niacin. For see, fennel for indigestion. This is valerian for insomnia. Green tea for joint pain. Lemon juice for kidney stones. Olive oil for lip cracking. Sage for memory lapses. And hypnotism for menopausal symptoms. And here we have ginger for nausea. Pressure for neck pain. Soy for osteoporosis. Um, I'm not sure how to say this one. Capsaicin. <laughs> Capsaicin for psoriasis. Avocado for razor burn. Eucalyptus oil for sinusitis. Whorehound tea for a sore throat. We've got clove oil for tooth and gum pain. Cranberry juice for a UTI or a urinary tract infection. Horse chestnut for varicose veins. Cod liver oil for vision problems. Honey for wounds. And over here, duct tape for warts. Sea salt for a yeast infection and tea tree oil for zits or pimples. Okay. So here is the story about racing the storm. These sailors that were in a bad storm. Looks like it was here off the coast of Florida. Oh well. Sounds like a of a boy scout. Category is 
I do my best thinking in the shower. So it says, um, Reddit had asked its users to share their most inspired shower thoughts. Okay, the results are dripping with genius. Okay, one is, if you attempt to rob a bank, you won't have any trouble with rent, food, bills for the next ten years, whether you are successful or not. And the next one here, my dog keeps bringing me the same toy. I wonder if that is his favorite toy or if he thinks it's my favorite toy. Sympathy for my bully. As a child, I was an easy mark for playground torments. Smart, insufferably rule-abiding, decidedly unpretty. The tormentor I remember most distinctly was not my first bully, nor my last, but his attacks would turn others into footnotes. He was in my class for years. In class photos, his face is round and almost cherubic but I remember it contorted in anger as he spat insults at me, telling me to shut up, flailing his hands against his chest and moaning, an approximation of what he said I sounded like. We were seated next to each other year after year, and when I finally complained about this arrangement, one of my teachers said that maybe I'd be a good influence on him. It didn't work. His mom was also my softball coach, driving me to and from practice when my single mother could not. Sitting in the back of his mother's van, after my team lost a softball game, he snapped, It smells in here. Close your legs. Reflexively, I did as he instructed. When his mother climbed into the driver's seat, oblivious to what had happened, he was still doubled over with laughter. I was ten. When I would return home after one of my bully's taunts, tearful and broken down, I'd comfort myself with the idea that one day I would be happy and successful, and my bully would not. I internalized the bro bromide used to soothe all bullied children of my generation, the universe would mete out some sort of karmic justice. This idea is everywhere. Bully Biff Tannen waxes George McFly's car at the end of Back to the Future. Having been beaten into submission, literally years earlier. In a Christmas story, Ralphie finally snaps after years of torment and attacks Farkas, who is left tearful and bleeding. Regina George, the Machiavellian Queen Bee in Mean Girls, eventually relinquishes her bullying crown, but only after she's publicly shamed twice and flattened by a bus. Even today, the internet is rife with stories of bullies getting their comeuppance. <laughs> that one was in the last one. Um, I know how to say that word now. From viral videos of little kids fighting back to Reddit threads describing justice doled out against an antagonizer. It's an old, it's an age-old story. The idea of bullies getting theirs says Megan Leahy, a licensed school counselor and parenting coach. It's a very human part of us that likes revenge. That seems only fair, right? After all, the bullies are the bad guys. According to a 2014 study that gathered data from more than 234,000 teenagers and children, 
Victims of bullying are more than twice as likely to contemplate killing themselves as their non-bullied peers. Other studies have shown that people who are bullied are more likely to experience low self-esteem and anxiety, more inclined to abuse alcohol and drugs, and more likely to suffer from a host of physical ailments, such as headaches and sleep disturbances. During the period when I was being bullied, my mother was dealing with her own abuse at the hands of a man with whom she'd been romantically involved for several years. He fluctuated between charming and volatile. He would yell, throw furniture and other objects, punch holes in the walls of our home, and tear doors off their hinges. At the time, I'd never seen my mother's boyfriend hit her, but my bully, who lived nearby, had seen him pull my mother from her vehicle and throw her to the ground. The next day at school, my bully told everyone within earshot the story. He laughed through his impersonation of her lying on the ground whimpering. Until that moment, I'd believed my mother when she told me that her bruised face was a result of walking into a door. As the years passed, those promises of karmic justice given to me in childhood came true. I went to college on a full ride, I graduated with honors, and became a professional writer. My mother finally extricated herself from her abusive relationship, determined not to follow in her footsteps. I sought out soft-spoken men who never yelled. I met and married someone wonderful. Everything turned out better than I could have dared hope. I occasionally searched for my bully online, determined to see my story to its promised end, to relish all the ways my life was better than his. In 2010, after years of finding nothing, I learned from a friend that my bully had been murdered in his home, not far from where we grew up. Consumed by the story, I poured over every news article I could find. He had been dealing pot and was killed in a robbery gone wrong. One of the murderers had been his childhood friend. I read that he had anticipated an attack. His friends said he was so terrified in the weeks leading up to his murder that he'd slept with a hammer under his pillow. I was haunted by what I imagined his final moments were like, by how scared he must have been. I cried for the boy who had made me so miserable. Now I had to wonder what kind of fate would I have considered sufficient retribution would I have been satisfied if he had become merely unsuccessful or unhappy? What sentence are we comfortable bestowing upon a fifth grader for his crimes? What's the statute of limitations for revenge? I wanted my bully's life to turn out rotten, but when it actually happened and didn't feel like justice had been served, it felt like I'd simply watched a building collapse in slow motion. The cracks in the foundation had started long ago. In the past few years, our culture has started to see bullying as a serious problem, one whose victims need help, support, and protection. But if right-thinking people want to care about bullying as a social problem, we need to see some nuance. Look at every bully and his or her victim, and you'll often find two kids who need help, not just one. As they grow up, bullies tend to have trouble keeping jobs, often have problems with alcohol and drugs, and are more likely to have criminal records. 
A large number of bullies are also victims of bullying. The idea that bullies themselves might be more than one-dimensional villains is hard to swallow, especially for those of us who've dealt with them. I never could have imagined feeling empathy for the boy who made my life hell, or for any bully. My bully Riddick killed me for having a mother who was a victim of domestic violence. He was dead at 25. I think of his anger, his struggles in school, his unhinged rage, all at the tender age of 11. I look at the narrative we are so often told as children that our lives will be wonderful and our bullies' lives will not, and I see the error in thinking that a troubled child somehow deserves a terrible fate. Ignore him and he'll go away, adults told me. In the end, they were right. barista. Your name is Beetlejuice and quietly walk out. <laughs> That's slimy shady. <laughs> Every time someone says, I'm aware, I always wait a couple seconds in case they add wolf. is called very superstitious. Most of us have an irrational fear or habit. Famous folks often seem to go one step further. Okay, this is about Benjamin Franklin. Okay, he has an odd morning ritual or head. Author, inventor, diplomat, and scientist Benjamin Franklin he was alive from 1706 to 1790, swore by air baths. Before he started his work day, Franklin would sit without any clothes on for up to an hour in front of an open window on the first floor of his building. He wrote that the shock of cold water was too violent for him, and it was more agreeable for him to bathe in cold air. Franklin would either read or write during his bath. Okay. And over here on this page, it's a picture of Diane von Furstenberg, the treasure from dad. Fashion designer and icon Diane von Furstenberg, born in 1946, she's still alive, tapes a gold 20 franc coin in her shoe for good luck before every runway show. Her father hid the coin in his shoe during World War II and gave it to her when she was a girl. Oh. Okay. Over here is a picture of John Wayne. A 10-gallon phobia. 
Although John Wayne, alive from 1907 to 1979, often wore a hat on his head in his films, his temper would flare if anyone left a hat on top of a bed. According to his daughter, Wayne was deeply superstitious and subscribed to the not uncommon fear that a hat on a bed was a harbinger of bad luck. Okay. And then we have John Steinbeck, The Right Way to Write. John Steinbeck was alive 1902 to 1968. He wrote the first drafts of The Grapes of Wrath, East of Eden, of Mice and Men and most every other one of his books the same way, by hand and in pencil. And he was very particular about his pencils, requiring perfectly sharpened black wing 602s. Okay. Okay, on this page right here we have Michael Jordan, uniform redesign. Michael Jordan, born in 1963, still alive, reportedly began the trend-setting change from mid-thigh basketball shorts to longer ones as a way of covering up a pair of University of North Carolina shorts, which he wore for good luck under his Chicago Bulls uniform. We have Lucille Ball, Feathered Foe. On the day that three-year-old Lucille Ball's father died, a bird flew into her home and became trapped. Traumatized by the events, she developed a lifelong avian aversion. The actor, 1911 to 1989, even refused to stay in hotels that had pictures of birds on the walls. Okay. And down here, Charles Dickens, Dreamcatcher. Author Charles Dickens, born or alive 1812 to 1870, carried a navigational compass with him at all times and always faced north when he slept. He believed it improved his creativity and writing. Okay. And over here, Gustav Mahler, Beware Number Nine. Composer Gustav Mahler, alive 1860 to 1911, thought he could cheat death by not naming his ninth symphony by number. This was because several composers, including Beethoven and Schubert, had died after completing their ninth symphonies. So Mahler called his ninth the Song of the Earth, and it worked in a sense, he lived long enough to write most of his tenth symphony, though he died before it was performed. Okay. Here is a story about how to conquer panic attacks. Someone wanted to hear this story. Inexplicable feelings of mortal terror strike six million Americans. Here is one woman's journey back to reassurance. It's six o'clock on a September evening in 2001, and I'm driving our minivan on a Toronto highway, heading to dinner at my parents' house. 
My husband is in Bermuda, where he has landed a two-year contract. He's looking for an apartment so I can join him. Now it's just me and my little black poodle making the half-hour drive I've made hundreds of times. The news is on the radio. Top story, the recent 9-11 terrorist attack. It seems I can't get away from the shocking stories and images. As I approach a bridge, my heart suddenly starts beating rapidly. Then my legs turn to jelly. You're going to drive off the bridge, a voice in my head warns. Now my arms are numb. You're about to lose control and die. I'm terrified. My hands grip the wheel. I just want to make it over the bridge and to an exit. I do. Then I pull into a parking lot and start to cry. What is happening to me? I tried driving on the highway a week later, and again, panic drove me to the first exit. After that, I took only smaller, slower roads. Weeks later, I moved to Bermuda, where we did not have a car. I was so relieved. I hadn't told my husband about the episodes. I knew he loved my independence and strength, and I felt ashamed of being so weak. To get around, we had a motor scooter that I rode on the back of, or I'd take the bus when I went somewhere on my own. I did this often over the first couple of months. But one day, as I rode the bus into town to do some Christmas shopping, my heart started racing. Sure enough, next came the sweating, my legs turning to jelly, and the feeling that somehow I'd lose control or go crazy. I hadn't reached my destination, but I rang the bell to exit and, in tears, walked home where I felt safer. A few days later, I tried the bus again, and the same thing happened. The thing that had forced me to avoid highway driving was now forcing me to avoid public transit. It was time to come clean. That evening, I told my husband what had been going on. He was sympathetic. I shouldn't have kept it bottled up because it felt good to let it out. But he was as mystified as I was. We searched online for fear of highways and fear of public transportation and got lots of hits, which is when we learned that the episodes were actually classic panic attacks. Unlike fear, which is a reaction to an actual threat, Panic is intense fear in the absence of real danger. Sufferers often report recent stresses, such as getting married or divorced, changing jobs, or financial or health problems. For me, the stressor was my upcoming move. Plus, I'd not been sleeping well. Sleeping poorly can make us more sensitive to anxiety-related events such as rapid heartbeat. Panic attacks occur when the brain identifies those events as signals of extreme peril. Humans are hardwired to survive, explains Elena Denisov, a clinical psychologist and director of CBT Associates in Toronto. The fight-or-flight response allows us to run faster, jump higher, if we're being chased. Physiologically, then, the brain's reaction to the rapid heartbeat danger signal is to move blood from the limbs to protect the core. This explains the feeling of limbs turning to jelly. The person isn't actually in danger but the brain misreads the signs as indicating a need to flee. 
Because the symptoms make you feel like you'll die, the first attack can lead to panic disorder, says Denisov. Your brain looks for situations when you should be fearful or feel trapped. You begin to fear the fear. It was time to tackle this. I wasn't about to let something in my mind terrorize my life without trying to fight back. I'd read that it helped to talk about it, so when I was back in Toronto for a visit, I told my best friend and her husband about the panic attacks. Lindsay looked at Todd with wide eyes, then said to me, Todd went through that a few years ago. When Todd was 28, he'd just taken over the family business and was feeling very stressed. One evening, when he was at a restaurant, his heart started pounding fast. He thought he was having a heart attack and went to his doctor. The doctor said, it sounds like you had a panic attack. He referred Todd to a psychiatrist who gave him a prescription for Ativan, an anti-anxiety drug taken when panic symptoms... Start. Todd took the medication and avoided restaurants, but then a panic attack hit when he was in an airport lounge. He learned relaxation techniques, including deep breathing. Eventually, the frequency of the attacks lessened, then disappeared, so he stopped the medication. Todd told me the drug was key and reading up on panic attacks really helped. He gave me his copy of Living with Fear, Understanding and Coping with Anxiety by Dr. Isaac M. Marks. Back in Bermuda, I dared to get back on the bus with the book in my handbag. When my heart started racing a few minutes into the journey, I opened the book to the dog-eared pages advising that panic wouldn't kill me. That really did calm me. For the next two years, I kept panic at bay this way. Even after we moved back to Canada, the land of highways, I treated myself not with therapy or medication, but by altering my behavior. For nine years after moving home, I relied on my husband to do all the highway driving. Then we bought a cabin. My husband would fix it up for weeks at a time while I worked in the city. The house was three hours away, and it wasn't on a bus route, so if I wanted to go on weekends, I would need to drive. Finally, it was time to find a psychologist. Panic disorder can be treated with antidepressants long-term and with beta blockers for immediate relief of symptoms, but experts recognize cognitive behavioral therapy, or CBT, as the best treatment. It resolves anxiety by changing the underlying beliefs that tell you the panicky feeling is itself dangerous. In my first therapy session, I practiced deep breathing. A long, slow inhale through the nose, a long, slow exhale through the mouth. This will be your tool to calm yourself when you feel panicky, the psychologist explained. A week later, we started imaginal therapy, a form of exposure therapy. The doctor asked me to imagine driving the least scary highway route near my home, rating my anxiety level from 1 to 10 with each step. 1, I said, mentally backing out of the driveway, then 2 as I turned into the next street. It jumped to 8 when I reached the road leading to the on-ramp. My heart was pounding. 
I was starting to sweat. Do your breathing, she said. She asked whether I'd ever kept something in my purse for when I felt unwell. In fact, I had peppermint gum for stomach upsets. Good, she said. Imagine you're chewing a piece of gum. Now, the moment of truth. In my imagination, I accelerated and merged into highway traffic. Ten. My legs turned to jelly, and I had that awful feeling that I'd lose control. It's okay, keep breathing, my therapist advised. It's only about half a mile to the first exit. Moments later, I saw the exit ramp in my mind and I began to calm down when I reached it. My relief turned back to fear when my therapist said, Your homework is to do that for real this week. Remember your breathing. Bring your gum. It won't be much different than doing it in your mind. So one Tuesday after dinner, I took a deep breath and grabbed the keys. Just like in therapy, my heart pounded as I got on the highway. But using my new tools, I made it to the exit without my physical symptoms escalating. I was overjoyed. We did imaginal therapy over four more sessions, each time taking a tougher or longer route. Each week, I was able to do it for real though I always returned home on regular roads. But finally, on a homework session that involved the scariest route yet, I exited the highway panic-free, then said to myself, what the heck, let's give it a go. I looped around and got back on the highway toward home. I haven't had a panic attack since. about um, cell phones, 13 ways your cell phone affects your body and mind. I don't think I'll read that one. Sorry if anybody wanted to hear that one. Okay. This is about how to make it as a fossil. Many species die off without a trace. If humans are to leave a lasting record, we'll need to make sure our DNA survives. That sounds interesting. Every fossil is a small miracle. Only an estimated one bone in a billion gets fossilized, preserved for thousands, even millions of years. By that calculation, the 327 odd million people alive in the United States today will leave a fossil legacy of only 67 or so bones. That's a little over a quarter of one human skeleton. If you are determined to increase the chances that your human eye corporis, I don't know if I'm saying that right, makes it for all eternity, or if you're just curious to know how to select how the select few survived, read on. Let's see, it says, get buried, end quickly. It says, you don't want your remains to be eaten and scattered by scavengers. <laughs> Just I'll go over these kind of quickly. Skip the coffin. You want minerals to seep into your bones and essentially turn them to stone. 
this process known as permineralization can take millions of years, but happens most rapidly when mineral-rich water imbues bones with things such as iron and calcium. A coffin might skip, might keep the skeleton nicely together, but it would interfere with this process. It says, find some water. If you die in a dry environment, once you've been picked over by scavengers, your bones will probably weather away. Better to get swiftly covered in sand, mud, and sediment. The best places for that are lakes, floodplains, and rivers, or the bottom of the sea. Thank you. 